You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago out of the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Today we're looking at verses 15 through 20. Exodus, chapter 14, looking at verses 15 through 20. Kind of an exciting, panicky time for the children of Israel as now they are wedged between the Red Sea and the formidable army of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. There are times when you and I are between the rock and the hard place too. Will we panic as Israel did? Or will we trust him to lead us through it? There are many different kinds of rocks and hard places or different kinds of Red Seas and Pharaoh's armies where we're wedged. But you'll discover as you move through Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, there are many occurrences which God gives to us as illustrations of where the people of God, either as a group or as individuals, are in those narrow straits and they have no way to go. No way to turn back, no way to go forward, no way to turn to the right, no way to turn to the left. They're stuck. In fact, you could look at almost every one of the prophets of the Old Testament and discover they were in a place between the rock and the hard place, between Pharaoh and the sea. You can look at Jeremiah down in the pit, up to his armpits in muck. You look at Daniel in the lion's den. You look at Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that is, between Nebuchadnezzar and the fiery furnace. Do you not know that God chooses to allow his people to be between the rock and the hard place so that he might refine them so that he might develop in them the character of Christ, so that he might build into our lives the faith in him that most perfectly glorifies him as God. We speak of him as our Redeemer, but we don't live like he is our Redeemer. The one who can save us, we speak of the Savior, but do we trust him to save us? In the times of crisis and panic, the times of discouragement, the times of frustration, the times of anger, the times of fear. Israel at the Red Sea is a picture of what it's like for you and for me today. And it's also a picture of how God is with his people and how he wants us to respond he will take care of going between us and the Egyptians. He calls on the leaders, not just the pastor, but in this case we've got elders as well, to raise the rod of God, which for us is the word of God, to stretch out the hand, to part the sea, and then to walk forward as those of you who walk by faith will follow. Because if you don't follow God's word, we're going to see some problems with that today. If you don't follow God's word, certain things, specific things, I've listed them for us today, will in fact happen. They happened in the Old Testament all the way through. They've happened in the New Testament from the days of the apostles till today to God's people who do not obey. It's serious business that we're dealing with, not merely looking at some historical narratives, and they are indeed true history, but they are God working in history so that we might know him, who he is, and what he expects of us who are his people. Quick review. Three weeks ago, we tried to get a better understanding of how long it took to move at least two million people at the same time. We saw Moses gave us the average pace for packing up, breaking camp, moving out, stopping, setting up camp, and calling it a day. 
We saw that by looking at the specific route taken by the Jews when they left Egypt. That route was recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In that speech made to Israel before they crossed the Jordan River, God gave Moses further details about the route of the journey up to Kadesh Barnea, which is where he sent out the spies. Then in verses 37 through 46, Moses discussed the reason for the 40 years in the wilderness, including the reason that God told him that he would see the promised land, but he would not go in. A serious warning to pastors and elders of churches. God also said that they would stay at Kadesh Barnea, that's the people of Israel, which as we apply it, we are not Israel, we are the church, but as we apply the principles, for these were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come, we're told that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So that we would learn from what happened to them. And God said that they were going to stay at Kadesh Barnea for a very long time because of their rebellion. In other words, their rebellion not only made Moses sin by striking the rock twice, he got angry at them. What, ye rebels, must we bring you water out of the rock? The issue was rebellion. Rebellion of the people of God. Moses got mad at their rebellion. He thought he was serving God, but in his anger, he struck the rock that second time. First time God had told him to smite the rock. Second time God said to him, speak to the rock and it will bring out water. And Moses in a fit of rage and remembering what he had done before when he had hit the rock, hit it again. And God said to him, because you have smitten the rock this second time, you will see the land but you will not go in because you have not sanctified me in the eyes of this people. It seems to be a small thing to us. After, at the end of Moses' life, after 120 years, not to be allowed to go into the land. Just because of one little tiny mistake, people we are dealing with a holy God there is no such thing as a little mistake one little sin can keep you out of heaven if you're not saved by the blood of Christ These things were written for us, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. We're told that in the New Testament three times. If we don't learn from what happened to them, we are doomed to suffer the same results and consequences that they had to suffer. Learn the lesson from others rather than experiencing the lesson for yourself. So, in other words, their rebellion not only made Moses sin by striking the rock twice, thus prohibiting from going into the land, but their rebellion also did and proved at least five things about themselves. Now listen, this is all new material that I'm covering from right now. So if you're taking notes, this is new material. I'm not just reviewing at this point. What I'm about to give you is new. If you haven't heard it, take out the piece of paper and the pen. You're going to get some new stuff, and while you're taking out your paper and pen, let me remind you why. God said to Moses, you'll see the land but not go in because we're told in 1 Corinthians 10 that the rock that followed them was Christ. And Christ was smitten only once. The cross of Calvary happened only once. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus died once and he is not sacrificed often. It says the priests offer up sacrifices daily which cannot remove sin. But this man, after he had made a sacrifice for sin once, sat down on the majesty on high. Roman Catholicism still practices the Old Testament with the continual, what they call the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass. They say that every time the host is elevated and the priest says in the words of the Mass, we offer unto you the only true and living God, that at that moment the cracker on top, the wafer on top, 
is transubstantiated into the body of Christ and the wine underneath is transubstantiated into the blood of Christ. Although they appear the same in substance, yet they are changed in substance. Their appearance looks the same, but Catholic theology teaches they are changed in substance. That's what transubstantiation means. So it becomes the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And that is an efficacious grace. That is, it has practical effect. So that when you take it, that you are therefore eating Christ and you are partaking of Christ and that's what your salvation is based on and if you miss the mass and if you die before you have the mass then you go straight to hell don't even get to stop at purgatory which is not in the Bible anyway and that's why priests do last unctions at the hospital and at the home because they want to make sure that that faithful Catholic gets that wafer and that wine to make it to heaven. That's not in the Bible. Either the Bible is true and Rome is a lie, or Rome is true and the Bible is a lie. You have to make a choice. Do you believe the Word of God which has lasted forever? Or do you believe a church in which there has been so much wickedness and perversion and even idolatry over the years? and has changed its position on many different things over the years. It used to be a mortal sin to eat meat on Friday. You had to eat only fish, and now it's okay. What, all the Catholics who ate meat on Friday before the Pope declared it back in the 50s to be okay? They all went to hell, and the ones who eat meat on Friday now get to still go to heaven? It's not funny. It's a serious issue. Either you will believe the word of God or you will believe the word of man. What are you staking your eternal salvation on? What are you staking your eternal salvation on? The word of men which has changed repeatedly or the word of God which stands forever? Why did it give on that? We were talking about the rock in the Old Testament. The reason it was struck only once was supposed to be struck only once is because Jesus died only once he was sacrificed once for sin not repeatedly over and over and over and over again and God kept Moses perhaps the greatest prophet of the Old Testament from going into the land because he disobeyed that one time you understand that God is serious with his people all right, so now let's look at the five things. There are five things that were proved by Israel's rebellion at Kadesh Barnea. Five things that were proved by the rebellion of Israel at Kadesh Barnea. First, number one. Number one, it guaranteed a long, lingering death in the desert. It guaranteed a long, lingering death in the desert for those who were aged 20 and over at the time of the Exodus. You know, that also happens to individuals and churches today for the same reason. Rebellion against the Word of God, rebellion against the direct commands and principles of the Word of God guarantees a long lingering death in the desert of your heart number two and churches die long lingering deaths I wonder if we're going through that second number two their rebellion guaranteed that the stubborn hearted rebels would not have any forward movement in their spiritual or physical journey. So number two is no forward movement in their spiritual or physical journey. It guaranteed that the stubborn hearted rebels would not have any forward movement in their spiritual or physical journey. In the sovereignty of God there comes a point of no return for the children who rebel. This is also true for believers today. You will, in fact, stagnate and atrophy in your spiritual growth 
in your forward progress and in your divinely ordained or approved successes when you step outside of the will of God. That's true for churches also. Something may occur that guarantees the death of a church no matter how much it tries later to move forward until all of the original rebels are dead. That's exactly what we see in the text. God didn't let them move forward to the promised land until all of the original rebels were dead. Whew. That's serious business. Only two made it. Out of at least two million people, I think they were closer to six million, out of those adults age 20 and over, only two made it. That's one in a million odds, not very good odds. Joshua and Caleb, because they wholly followed the Lord. They did not rebel. They stood against the crowd. They said, we're able to go forward and take it because God is with us. They are nothing. The giants of the land, they're nothing. We have Jehovah who just parted the sea. We have Jehovah who just smacks Pharaoh. We have Jehovah who judged Egypt with ten plagues. We remember what God did. Let's go forward. Only two made it. Not very good odds. No forward movement in their spiritual or physical journey. Third, point three. Their rebellion also guaranteed something else. Their rebellion guaranteed that when they tried to humanly fix things up by trying to do what God commanded, remember God, they said, we're going to rebel against God, we're not going to go. So God said through Moses, he said, all right, then you will not go up, you will stay in the wilderness. So he said, oh, no, no, don't give us that. We'll go back and we'll obey you. We don't want to be in the wilderness any longer. Well, we'll obey you. God said, sorry, too late. He guaranteed that when they tried to fix things up by doing what God had originally commanded, and then they wouldn't, and then he said, okay, I'll judge you, that their enemies would beat the daylights out of them. Remember they decided they were going to go up and take the hill? They said, no, no, we'll, we'll do it. We'll go forward. Moses said, I'm not going with you. The Ark of the Covenant's not going with you. God's not going with you. See what happens in the flesh. See if you can do it in the flesh. And they went up to the hill and it says they were smitten by their enemies. In other words, the principle of repentance too late. That's number three is repentance too late. Trying to fix things up. Efforts too late to fix things up. Just like Esau and book of Hebrews tells us Esau found no place for repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. That's also what I've called the principle of no return. There comes a point of no return whereby God says, okay, you've lost that blessing. You've lost that position. You've lost that opportunity. You've lost the impact that you would otherwise have had for Christ. You're going to wander in the wilderness. The point of no return. Number four. Fourth. Their rebellion guaranteed that they would not personally inherit the land. Now, inheritance is not a picture of salvation. Inheritance is a picture of the future blessings and rewards that God has for us who are his children. But their rebellion guaranteed that they had lost their inheritance. You know, when a child stubbornly rebels against his parents, there may come a point when the parent says, you know what, I'm not going to give that child the inheritance. I don't like what that child has done. I don't like what that child has said. That child has been a rebel against me. That child has, you know, snuffed their nose at me. That child has done me dirty. That child has decided, hey, the old man, the old woman doesn't know what she thinks or talks about. I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to sass them. I'm going to just be so stubborn that they won't know what to do about it. You know, the parent has every right to write the child out of the will so that they don't get an inheritance. Nothing at all. Nothing says... There is no law that requires, and certainly not the law of God, 
for a parent to leave anything to his or her children. Nothing, zero, zilch, nil. Because inheritance is not a right, inheritance is a privilege. Inheritance is a blessing. And God illustrates another principle out of Proverbs. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, to his grandchildren, in other words. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. God did that with Israel. He didn't leave it to the children. He left them to the children's children. The children of Israel, the ones who left Israel, died in the wilderness. It was their children who got the inheritance of the blessing of the land. So that was number four. It guaranteed that they would not personally inherit the land, even though it had been promised to them. This shows that the promises and blessings of God can be lost for disobedience. This happens to people and churches today. At some point, because of your hard heart, the blessing and promises to you are gone. They evaporate even as though they had never been there. Number five. The rebellion of Israel guaranteed the reason they rebelled was both stupid and irrelevant. The rebellion of Israel proved that the reason they rebelled was both stupid and irrelevant. What was the reason they rebelled? They claimed that their kids would become slaves to the pagans. No, 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 we can't do that because after all, then all of our children will become slaves to the pagans. You know, that was both a stupid and an irrelevant reason for rebelling. In reality, they were using that as an excuse. In reality, they were really afraid for their own personal skin. But they used their kids as the excuse. That's true today. A lot of parents use their kids as an excuse for not obeying God's command to be in church. A lot of parents use their kids as the excuse for refusing to give generously to the church because they have to pay for the care of the kids. A lot of parents use their kids as the excuse for refusing to keep their kids out of the pagan schools because Christian schools cost too much and homeschooling takes too much time. And besides, how can I teach? I've heard this so many times, it blows my mind. How can I teach my kids algebra and trigonometry when their kids are only in second grade? Can you imagine... If the Israelites had sent their kids to the Philistine schools, what God would have thought about that or said about that? People, if you send your kids, or you see your grandkids going to the Philistine schools, you should say something about it, or do something about it. They'll grow up to be little Philistines. A lot of parents use their kids as the excuse for arguing, well, I want my kids to be socialized, so how can I homeschool? <laughs> we heard that argument. We were among some of the first, as far as we know, homeschoolers in the United States years and years and years and years ago, where there were no laws in any states that specifically provided for homeschooling. And people, other Christians, it was mostly Christians, said to us, but how will your kids be socialized? Socialized? Do I want them to be socially on the same level as their peers who are a bunch of little liars and cheats and thieves and stealers and later on fornicators and thieves and adulterers and all kinds of murderers and drug addicts? Is that what I want for socialization for my kids? Socialized? You know, that's answered very easily in another area where most Christians are very disobedient. Because most Christians refuse to have more kids because after all, kids are expensive and that's why I can't give so much to the Lord and so on. We're back to where we started.
how thankful I am to God for giving us 13 children. Do you know what? They really learned socialization. And they didn't just learn it with kids their same own age. Because socialization is teaching your children to become mature, godly, Christian adults who will function with moral integrity in a world of perverse darkness. And so what you want to set before them as their example is not their peer group, but their parents, their grandparents, and siblings who may be older than they who have been trained in these things and who help with the younger children. And I tell you, I am sure thankful for my older children. And I'm telling you, my oldest daughter, <laughs> she was a good little mommy. Boy, did she help my wife over and over. And in our little one-room schoolhouse, as my wife taught those children, the little kids who had the little teeny lessons were actually hearing another lesson going on, which was with a kid older than they were. And so they heard it, the youngest one heard it at least 13 times before she got to that point of being number one on the list. They learned well. And they were socialized well. In other words, what we've been talking about are the stupid reasons for, reasons for disobeying the clear commands of God. And these are only a few of the stupid reasons we give for disobedience in relation to our children. And then Christian parents are amazed when their children turn out bad after the stupid parents sent them to public schools, let them watch TV, let them play on the internet, let them have their own cell phones, let them participate in questionable activities, and generally encourage them. They claim, oh, I don't want them to be like the pagan world around them. We don't want the pagans to eat them up. That was what Israel said. But they've actually encouraged them to become slaves of the pagan culture around them by immersing their children in the pagan culture. That brings us to point number six. Point number six. The rebellion of Israel guaranteed that the disobedient, self-serving claim of the Israelites proved at least four things, which also prove four things about our disobedient, self-serving claims in whatever area. We're not just talking about child rearing. This is true all the way across the board with Israel in every time that they rebelled against God, all the way through their history. They're always self-serving claims when we disobey. We always have our reasons for disobeying. And every one of our reasons goes back to self. It doesn't matter where you disobey the word of God. It always goes back to you think you're better and wiser than God who told you to do something. The disobedient self-serving claims of the Israelites proved at least four things, which also proved four things about our disobedient self-serving claims. Number one. Even at that late date in their journey, they really had not learned to obey God. That was number one. They really had not learned to obey God. Number two. They really had not learned to walk by faith instead of insisting on walking by sight. They had not learned to walk by faith instead of insisting they wanted to walk by sight. Number three, and here this certainly hits us as Americans, and this should be a lesson for us, what happened to Israel in the wilderness. Number three, they only had temporal values rather than eternal values. They only had temporal values rather than eternal values. That is the great temptation in America today. Because there is so much temporal stuff that is so freely available to us and so cheap that we can hoard it. We can pack it in. We have to buy a warehouse to store all the junk that we've got. Temporal values instead of eternal values. Number four, they didn't understand the sovereign, omnipotent power of God. They didn't understand the sovereign, omnipotent power of God. 
even after seeing with our own eyes the ten plagues in Egypt, even after personally crossing the Red Sea on dry ground, and in general, they manifested for the tenth time. Remember, this point is the tenth time. It's the point of no return. They manifested for the tenth time that they would not obey, and they expected to get away with it again. We know they expect to get away with it again because they said, when God said, okay, you won't go in, then you'll die in the wilderness and you'll wander for 40 years. They said, no, 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 we will obey, we will obey, we will obey. God said, too late. Moses told them, I'm not going with you. Ark of the Covenant's not going with you. If you go, expect to get beaten. You will be beaten before your enemies. And the enemy beat the living daylights out of them. Point of no return. They didn't understand the sovereign, omnipotent power of God. It was because of their rebellion. Remember what we read? And the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, remember this was their excuse, Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, little babies, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. Repentance too late. We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord God commanded us. And when you girded on every man his weapons of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously into the hill. And the Amorites, which dwelt in that mountain, came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken unto your voice, nor give ear to you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days, according unto the days that ye abode there. There's still more. But rather than enter the next section, our time is up. Dear people, these things were written for our example upon whom the ends of the world are come. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Father, help us not merely to write it down in our heads. Help us to internalize it in our hearts. We stand before a holy omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, sovereign God who will not be mocked by his own people. Though he is long-suffering and deals with us gently over and over, there comes a point of no return if we rebel, if we harden our hearts, if we stubbornly refuse to obey, if we stubbornly refuse to do what he has commanded because we want to give our reasons. We're thinking about our own skin. We're thinking about our own popularity, our own personal privileges, our own prosperity, our own pleasure. And so we say no. And God finally says, then all right. You will die in the wilderness because you've made the wrong choice. You've taken my mercy and my grace for granted and you've disobeyed for the last time. I'll give my blessing to someone else. Father, teach us to be an obedient children. and cause us to do so with joy, with love, and with faith in the one who has called us to serve him, even our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn for today.